Hey everybody, NFT fans, welcome back to the Envelope Podcast. I'm your host, Eugene Creator MC, and I'm here today with the blockchain lady from Vietnam. She's Nicole. She's the founder and CMO of Two Least King. Their goal is to bring democracy to NFT card games. She's also startup scout, community builder, emerging tech evangelist. So Nicole, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Eugene. Hi, everyone. I will start with uh, your personal story in crypto. Tell us briefly, how did you get into the blockchain space, especially being a lady? What were your main incentives for that? Um, so honestly, I started my blockchain uh, journey without any incentive. Uh, I was very bored at that time. You know, after 10 years working in different companies, in uh, corporates, I even started uh, like a company by myself, but then I did not really find anything, you know, challenging for me to, to continue my journey. So at that point, I just bumped into a friend. Um, I think he was crazy at that point, you know, because he just kept feeding me this information about a, a world changing technology. And back then, uh, you know, uh, blockchain was associated with Bitcoin and there was nothing good about it, uh, you know, across media. Even my parents were very worried, worried, you know, if I mentioned about Bitcoin. So that was like a no, no to everyone. Uh, so, I mean, I, I just stepped into the space because I found it different, uh, something new, uh, some, a new opportunity for me to, to do something different. Um, so then I, I joined him in this company called uh, Cardano Lab in Vietnam. And then later we rebranded to Viet, uh, Infinity Blockchain Labs. So we were the first uh, blockchain startup in Vietnam and also one of the larger uh, startups who was doing, you know, community initiatives, meetups, educational events around blockchain. Uh, including a, an event called Vietnam Blockchain Week back in 2018 for 2,000 people. Uh, so we were very passionate about it. Uh, and then um, I was also having the community initiative and marketing for my company. Um, so that's when it all started back in 2016. Um, it's, it seems like a decade. It seems like a century ago uh, because in crypto, you know, things are moving at lightning speed. Uh, so I do believe that, you know, a lot of people have, have got a big opportunity right now when the space is getting more mature uh, and we will be happy to have more newbies or even more veterans coming in uh, for this new technology. Yeah, so interesting story. I totally agree with you that we are rapidly growing now. But tell us what is Dualist King? What does it mean bringing democracy to NFT card games? What is are the values of Dualist King for its target audiences? So Dualist King is what we call a democrat. Uh, our main mission is to democratize NFT card games. So we saw that there are a lot of uh, challenges in the traditional card game space, you know, where everything in the, in the game revolves around the distributor. So uh, if you are a gamer, you have to abide by the rules. Uh, you have to follow, you have to buy the designs uh, set out by the, by the game distributor. And also you would not have any other rights or any other engagement in the game beyond a gamer. Uh, so we want to change that. And we think that blockchain is a great fit, you know, to decentralize the space uh, and also to bring in more power to the community. So with Duelist King, what we want to do is that we want to engage the community beyond uh, what normally happens in a NFT card game. Uh, so with us, we build our own in-house uh, distribution system to allow fair distribution of game assets, starting with the cards. And we also want to, uh, you know, to build our own DAO as well to engage the community. Either they are creators, uh, gamers, game designers, or even, you know, investors uh, in the space. So we want them to contribute to the game. Uh, also want them to vote for the favorite gameplay and the game designs. And later on, they will be the owners of the ecosystem as a DAO because we think that that should be the way uh, that we should move forward. And gaming is one of the better space for us to exercise the decentralization power of blockchain. Um, so that's a, that's a bit about us. Definitely, that's a great mission. I know that people in Asia, they love games and they love NFT games. And we also have a super renowned case of Philippines. More than a million people on Philippines are playing X Infinity, earning money for cars for, for a living. This is incredible. How do you explain uh, this Philippine case in X Infinity, knowing what's going on in Asia? Asian mindset. Okay. Um, I think, well, this might be like a double-edged sword, yeah? So the people in, I think in Southeast Asia, they have a strong entrepreneurial and also hustling spirit. 
uh, especially you know in COVID time, basically people would just hustle around just to to earn a living. And I think with gaming, this is a very exciting and a very I would say emerging space for people to enjoy uh, when they earn when they have some earnings. So it's like passive earning. So I think that you might know that of course this uh, Southeast Asia is a bigger market for a lot of I mean even like gambling, uh, even like gaming space. Uh, because the people in here, they believe that, that they can do something. They, they always strive for something better. Uh, so, of course, on the other hand, uh, there would be a lot of, you know, the, the, the downsides of this when people might get too spiraled in the gaming ecosystem. They might, also, they might go to the game to look out for earnings and for money. And this might be a sweet spot for a lot of the scammers in the space. Um, so I think that on, on this side, of course, there, there are a lot of, there are some bad apples in the space, but of course, there are also a lot of, uh, let's say, better guys in the market like XC and us, and we try to, uh, you know, kind of create more opportunity for people. But what's different with us is that um, we are not too big on play to earn. Uh, I know that this is something very different from other game projects in the market, um, but we think that at the moment, um, maybe the, there's, a, there's a lack of education in the market. So a lot of people look at this space, look at blockchain gaming as a source of passive earning. Uh, so we think that that's not a very sustainable way to move forward. Uh, so with our game, we do advocate what we call win to earn. Uh, so we want people to enjoy the game, engage in the game, and then earn from the game. Uh, so we want people to really you know, pay attention to the game as the game itself. Uh, so that's why we spend a lot of efforts on the game design and the gameplay uh, to make sure that people really love it, people really indulge in it, and then they can earn from the game. Yeah, I love it. I love the story. Uh, how did you get your first exposure with NFTs, non-fungible tokens? And how do you explain, for especially for new buyers, newcomers, non-crypto people, what the hell is NFT? Okay, uh, I mean, this. Uh, I also got to ask this question a lot. So, I mean, in, in, in short, uh, let's say in short, uh, NFT is like a digital representation, uh, of course, powered by cryptography as well of, a, of anything, of anything that you consider of value to, you know, to the community. I think this is very important. So there's a lot of, I would say, useless NFTs and useless tokens in the market because basically there's no utility to it, um, there's no market to it, and there's no value to it either. Uh, so I think with NFTs, uh, the most important thing is to see how it's going to be able to create, uh, I would say, extra value you know, to, uh, to the users either as a physical or digital kind of uh, representation. So uh, with my, for myself, my exposure definitely is with Duelist King. <laughs> that will be the most intense exposure that I had. I had a couple of, I mean, you know, the cute uh, kind of characters before, but that was more like out of my hobby. But with Duelist King, this is a serious kind of uh, space where I get, where I have skin in the game. I would also have to try out how to buy it, how to make people, especially even the, the gamers, to be able to access to it, um, you know, think about it from the community and also users' experiences. Um, so I think this is also a very interesting space. And uh, we also had this talk, you know, back at uh, Game On Summit. So we also spoke about what would be the, I would say, the more, uh, I, let's say, the more progressive um, areas for or more sweet spots for uh, NFTs to thrive. So I think a lot of people vote for gaming, of course, because this, this, uh, this is the better place for us to do. Of course, we talk about arts, we talk about AR and VR, uh, also about experimental arts. Um, but I think gaming is definitely going to open the space for a lot of people to try out this without knowing that they are doing it, you know, with NFTs. So the game assets, whatever they are doing in the game, anything can be tokenized, anything can be traded as an asset. So the thing is with the seamless onboarding and with the seamless user experience, I believe a lot of people, uh, you know, can actually, uh, you know, join this space. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Because the problem of onboarding people from traditional gaming into the crypto blockchain gaming do exist, and I, and I know it's hard to onboard. So I would love to ask you about marketing. You are the co-founder and also the chief marketing officer of Tulis King. Is it hard to merge these roles? Is it hard to be the CMO of a blockchain project in general? Uh, I think anything that involves startup is very challenging, and especially because uh, we don't have this, uh, I, I would say the versatility uh, in a startup is, is huge, especially when it comes to, you know, roles and responsibilities. Even as a CMO, I think I find myself across, you know, all over the place, 
So doing business development, doing community. Uh, so anything that you don't have resources to do, that's where we would do. So I, we would normally trip about our CEO. So he's like chief, except chief everything officer. So he just has to, you know, kind of pitch in whenever we don't have anyone to do, you know, that kind of task. And that applies to all of our founding team. So um, I think also that's the beauty of, uh, of, of startup as well. Uh, and if you can uh, survive uh, the, the first period, uh, the reward is going to be, you know, mensurate to what we put in. I don't find it very difficult, you know, to merge, uh, let's say, my mainstream journey in marketing with this one. But the thing is that uh, with blockchain, the learning curve is very steep. And whenever we ask any people if they want to join our team, we have to ask them if they are willing to join this steep curve with us. Because if the people, if the person doesn't have a, a learning spirit, uh, you know, I don't think they can survive in this space for even for two or three weeks or months. Um, so, I mean, like, uh, of course, the skills on the mainstream side does help. Um, but I think on the blockchain side, we need to be, uh, you know, open for learning. And the second is that the community is, is what, it's what matters most to blockchain startups. So before we talk about, let's say with marketing, we have users, we have clients, uh, you know, we have all of these people around like stakeholders, but let's say in, in blockchain, uh, we kind of put them all in a community. We kind of have different categories of community, but everything that we do needs to come back and divert back to the community. And it has to make sense to the community. And uh, I think that it's kind of shifted focus, you know, from us and from, let's say our users to, to the whole community. So maybe that's the main difference that, that I did notice. Yeah, okay. You know, I sort of love this phrase, chief everything officer. That's the best <laughs> explanation of who is CEO. I would love to yeah. And I will also be saying, Nicole from Vietnam, from Dulles King, said me this phrase, chief everything officer. So we'd love you to- I appreciate you, sir. Thank you. To, to pursue this, this topic, is blockchain marketing in the blockchain space in general? Is it different or similar uh, comparing with marketing in traditional areas, uh, information technologies, retail, and so on and so forth? The principles are the same, but what are the specific specifics of marketing in the blockchain, especially in the space? What would you mention? Okay. Um, I think this is, a, this is a very interesting question. Um, I used to work in the traditional marketing space for two years. Uh, not that much, but uh, we were, I used to work for a fast-moving consumer goods. And in that company, um, there's, a diff, uh, there's a very big specialization on what kind of users you are talking to, what kind of stakeholders you are talking to. And even you know, if you're talking about B2B or B2C, uh, we also have different kind of clients and different kind of consumers that you're talking to. And everything needs to be structured, uh, needs to be uh, kind of framed you know, around that user specifically. And uh, the, main, the main task would be about coordinating you know, different campaigns to reach out to these kind of people. But then with uh, the blockchain space and with gaming, um, sorry, with NFT, for example, um, I do think that uh, we have that kind of classifications of users and stakeholders. So with NFTs, of course, even especially with our games, we have gamers, uh, we have designers, uh, we have investors as well. We need to cater to each of their needs. And the, the more important is that, um, I mean, basically we, we can you know, offer a lot of these offerings to them. But at the end of the day, of course, there's a lot of things that has to come back to the utilities of the token and with the NFTs. And uh, we only, you know, you know, everything, you know, around that, uh, they has to come back and translate back to the utilities because that's, that's the most important thing, you know, that we need to do with the tokens. And you don't have the freedom or the liberty to change your offerings that much, you know, compared with a, a normal, I would say, retail products where you can just launch different variants, different perfumes and different colors, for example. But with this one, you have to be very clear about the vision that you have in the beginning and then, uh, you know, kind of try to come up with a utility that can cater to different stakeholders group. And it's an evolving process uh, just to do that. Uh, and I love, you know, how marketing is kind of um, the, the marketing in this blockchain space because it keeps changing every day, uh, the landscape, the people, the industry. Uh, so yeah, yeah that's, totally. what I, that's what I love most about this job. Totally agree. I see a lot of your job. When I see, when I hear the world stakeholder, I understand that I am dealing with a professional because this is a professional term. <laughs> so Nicole, you come from Asia, you have Asian born, 
Jim Roots, but you are Western educated. Your English is perfect. If I you know that you're from Vietnam, I would say you're from US. Uh, do you see any difference in perception of blockchain and NFT uh, about in Asian region and Europe and West region? Is that difference or not? Um, at the moment, I would say that it's uh, this is one of the more homogeneous markets, uh, you know, in terms of uh, culture and behaviors of the users. Um, I don't I don't notice any uh, major difference between an Asian or a European when it comes to, let's say, uh, the perception about token utilities, uh, the benefits of the NFTs or how they perceive the NFTs. Uh, the, the key question is still, what's in it for me? So what, you know, these NFTs are gonna, are gonna bring value to me. Uh, so with our game right now, of course, our main focus is Southeast Asia, but of course we do pay attention to a lot of these West Asian market, like, you know, Turkey and India, uh, also on the Austra sorry, on the European side and the US. And you can see that with that kind of, you know, geographical diversity, um, there's no kind of, you know, one size fit all communication that we can do. The thing is that we have a top line kind of message and the way that we deliver the message uh, is gonna be up, is gonna be contingent uh, upon our partners. So we choose to work with different local partners to tap into these markets and speak the language and kind of cater to the culture. But then the top line message uh, I, I see so far that there's, not, there's no major difference. How would you mention the main problems diseases or pains of NFT markets participants, because uh, NFT market is relatively young, every growing market has its pains. How would you describe the growing problems we <laughs> should <laughs> care and cure in the future? Right. Um, I think the NFT space is, is emerging, but this is one of the few trends in the crypto space where people believe that it might last longer than a, uh, than a boom market. Uh, so I think I spoke with, uh, you know, a lot of these professionals and also startup uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, I think we can see, uh, we can notice that in the, what we call like crypto climate, right? Like this year. So normally by this time last year, I think that it's already like, it has already, it was very chaotic. So people would come and leave uh, and they would not come back until the crypto summer. Uh, but I think for, for this time, uh, the climate has gotten more mild, I would say, and more I, I think more it's easier to breathe for a lot of people because the sentiment is, is definitely higher because we have this uh, NFT trends coming. So I think that the main, uh, I would say not the main challenge, but let's say uh, uh, one of the key growth barriers to this NFT space, uh, I think it's still more about the onboarding uh, for users. At the moment, uh, I think for crypto people, it's also very, you know, fairly simple for us to, let's say, connect MetaMask, do all of these tokenization and then trade our NFTs. But it's still like a whole new, different, whole different world for the for the mainstream users, and we are kind of let's say detached from the let's say ninety percent of the remaining world if we don't onboard them. So if we are talking about NFT, especially even in gaming space or in arts, um, right now I think most of the projects, even XC, they are focusing more on NFT and crypto users, which make up just maybe less than ten percent of the whole market. Uh, so I think we can solve this problem. The onboarding, it can be about user experience. It can be about payment. Uh, it can be about commercialization of the product. Then I think we will be able to achieve much higher, uh, I would say, uh, level of success uh, for the space. Yeah, I would love to ask you about legal issues. I don't know, do you touch them or don't? Or don't? Perhaps perhaps you do because you, you, you are a co-founder. So I honestly say I don't know anything what's going on in Vietnam about crypto regulation. I know Axie Infinity are coming from Vietnam. It's everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All I know about <laughs> Vietnam and crypto. But Southeast Asia, where Asia Pacific, let's uh, name it that, is quite big region, many countries. What, how could you describe re regulation, regulation of crypto in the South Asia? We know Singapore and Hong Kong are in, in front of that. We know that China is the biggest new newsmaker in banning crypto. Last she it's been banning crypto uh, uh, last years. What's going on in Vietnam regarding regulation? What's going on in Southeast Asia regarding regulation crypto? Will governments tending to be to create uh, specific legal frameworks for NFT? 
I don't wish, <laughs> so, but we need to be prepared for that. What can you say about all this? <laughs> okay. Um, well, the, the thing is that, uh, well, uh, just to clarify, I mean, XC, one of the founder, co-founders of XC is a Vietnamese, but the company is not registered uh, under Vietnam legislation. It's a Singaporean company on paper, on paperwork, if you, if you notice that. So, um, Obviously, I mean, the, the space in Vietnam is, is getting uh, really robust. Uh, a lot of companies are you know, developing projects in here. We know that we also have, let's say, the second largest number of crypto users in the world. Uh, so the thing, is, but the thing is that uh, not a lot of companies here are registered under, uh, you know, as a Vietnamese company. So most of the, most of the companies here were registered under uh, Singaporean law or Hong Kong law. So that will, that's also like, you know, the headlines of a lot of these discussions of media these days. Um, I also spoke to some regulators from Vietnam and of course, you know, they're like, they, they also look out for, you know, let's say the neighboring countries, what they are doing with crypto. At the moment, if you notice uh, in Southeast Asia, so let's say Malaysia and Indonesia, they are also very, they are stepping up their game. The regulators are stepping up their game. So pretty much they have this, uh, a, a list of these register and license exchanges. For instance, Singapore is definitely ahead of the pack. Uh, but a, a lot of other countries, let's say Vietnam and other countries, they're still uh, in the gray area section, what, what, what we call it. Um, so I think for Vietnam right now, um, the government does notice the importance of this space and the growth of this space. Uh, and then they are trying to, I think, come up with a more friendly framework in, in the first place. Because basically looking at, uh, I mean, other countries around uh, cracking down on crypto does not do anybody good. Because uh, basically, of course, you know, as I mentioned, people in Southeast Asia has a very strong hustling uh, culture. They will just go, you know, where the opportunity flows. So uh, I think the, the Vietnamese government does, does notice that. And we are trying to at first come up with a sandbox, and maybe later with some guidelines, you know, for people to hash the risk uh, against any risk that might come with crypto. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why right now, you know, there has been no strict kind of legal framework around blockchain yet in Vietnam. Uh, but I, I do think that in the, in the coming, you know, in, in the coming months, uh, we, were, we might be able to see some kind of guidelines from the government. Yeah, it's been extremely interesting to talk to you, Nicole. Finally, I would love to ask you how to follow you on the internet. What's the best way to do it? And you are going to take part in upcoming CGC 9th conference in September. 23, 24, what will you be speaking there about? Uh, okay, so I think the easiest way, uh, I'm more old school person, so I am more active on Facebook. Uh, if you look at my name and you type Nicole Nguyen uh, and Space Blockchain, I think you might be able to see me among all of those people because uh, I'm, I'm one of the rarer, I think maybe like uh, Vietnamese in this space with the name Nicole. Uh, so with at, at CGC, uh, I would be also speaking about, uh, you know, like of course about Julius King and about, about a vision. But of, of course, we're also talking about uh, how, you know, community empowerment can be exercised with gaming and also about blockchain gaming platform because that's also one of the things that we are very passionate about. So Duelist King is actually one of the use cases on our platform called DKDAO. And we plan to build this DKDAO into like a bigger in gaming ecosystem where we can have state channels, uh, gaming wallets, also like tokenization and DAO solutions for other games to join us as well, even the mainstream gaming studios. So I think that will be the more, some of the more appealing uh, topics for me to share with you. So I hope to see some of, your, uh, some of you here uh, and also at CGC as well. Well, thank you very much, Nicole. It has been a fascinating, super educational talk, especially about Southeast Asia. I've learned a lot from our talk. Ladies and gentlemen, you were watching the Envelope podcast. It is supported by the Nifty Protocol and the DAO Envelope. Please like, share, comment, subscribe on the channel, and hit the bell button for not missing the future episodes. Nicole, the CMO of Tuileskin and Eugene Crypto MC, we're with you. Let's meet on CGC upcoming event. The link are is written down below. So thank you for listening and see you in the next episodes. Bye-bye. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks, everyone.